the heart check-ins. Alhamdulillah. Um, we hope that all of you are, are, are doing well. And then secondly, let's start, inshallah, um, this text that we're going to be going through. And this is, of course, an unedited translation. So uh, forgive any of the jankiness that may be there. But Imam Ibn Juzay was an Andalusian scholar. Uh, the PDF there is in um, the chat room who, subhanAllah, he was a polymath. He wrote in every subject, whether it was fiqh, whether it was tafsir, Arabic language, uh, you know, just so many different things he did, mashallah. Uh, and his tafsir is really taught uh, as, a, as a beginning tafsir. So what I plan for us to do uh, exclusively with you guys every Wednesday, uh, Thursday night, excuse me, at 11 p.m., is to go through, first of all, the traditional way of teaching tafsir, as I said earlier, was to introduce the foundations of tafsir foundations of the Quran. What are the things that I need to know before I walk into the science? The second thing is after that, and we don't have time to do this, but we'll try to inculcate it a little, is someone would actually like at Azhar, we went through every word of the Quran. And then someone would take kind of like a broader tafsir. So what we plan to do is go through the usul al-tafsir uh, that he mentions, and he mentions 12, but we're going to touch on eight. Um, and then We'll go into Surah Al-Fatiha. And after we finish the first chapter of the Quran, we'll take the last 10 chapters of the Quran, 12 chapters of the Quran, and then we'll take Surah Al-Hujurat. Alhamdulillah. And for those of you who are trying to learn to read the Quran, my teacher, actually Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Abu Fatuh, is going to start a class on Swiss um, on the foundations for reading the Quran. So you can take that Tajweed class that I have up, Tuhfat Al-Atfal, uh, the small, small poem that I've been covering, but then also that course with him. And he's a master of the Quran, mashallah. Uh, very, very, very like great, knowledgeable person of the science of reading the Quran. So as I said earlier, the word Quran, there are two opinions about this word, qara'a. One is to bring two things together. So Allah says, talata taquru, right? The menstrual cycle of a woman is talata quru. Uh, the other is that the Quran comes from a word which means to recite. And some scholars brought both words together because when you recite, you bring together letters and words and you, and you express them in complete thoughts. Uh, theologically, the Quran is what was revealed to the Prophet wasallam, which its recitation can be used in salah. So that's what makes it different than the sunnah, than hadith, and who begins with Surah Al-Fatiha and ends with Surah Al-Nas and has been passed to us through what's called At-Tawatur. Tawatur means that so many people passed it in the way that it is that it's impossible for there to be like mistakes or a lie. In, 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 in Islamic thought, we have what's called a tawatur yufidu yaqeen, which means when something has been passed down by so many people in a given era, like all the Sahaba and their students, right? Um, then it's impossible for it to be like wrong or, or, or related to us incorrectly. And most importantly, we believe that because in the 15th chapter of the Quran, Allah says, inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Right? We revealed the Quran, we will protect the Quran. What we're going to go through tonight are the first two foundational principles for understanding the Quran. And the first is the actual revelation of the Quran. And then the second is a, a division of the chapters of the Qur'an. And so each week for the next few weeks, we'll go through one or two of these foundations. And then when, once we finish them, then we'll move on to um, Surat Al-Fatiha, inshallah, inshallah. Do you have any questions about this before we start? I plan to also put together a syllabus, uh, and I'll post that on a Google like classroom uh, that I think we can use privately, hopefully, for for this class, so you'll be able to follow along. So are there any questions about this before we start, inshallah? Awesome, awesome. Um, so the first foundation that he talks about in his tafsir, and this again is the name, I changed the name here because I, I, I abridged it. Um, his is Tashil Fi Ulum al right? The, 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 the easing or the, the, the easy process of understanding the foundations of revelation. I kind of changed it to Muqaddimat al -tasheel. So the first thing that he talks about, and this is going to be important, like if you're a new Muslim, especially, it's going to be going to be important if you're a teacher, if you're a youth director, if you're an imam, uh, and just someone who wants to have a better, like, how do you create a intimate relationship with the Quran? 
Like, how do I feel like the Quran is like my boy, man? You know what I mean? How do I create that relationship? The Quran is someone, something that I can go to. Imam al-Busti, uh, he was a great scholar from Afghanistan. He said, And if anyone wants to write in the notes some of the things I'm saying in the chat, feel free to do so. Imam al-Busti, he was from Afghanistan. He said, He said, you know, you should cling to the, the Quran, cling, use your hand and cling to it with all your might. Because it will be your support when all other supports are gone. Uh, Sayyidina Ash-Shaltibi, he said, وَعْلَمْ he said, he said, you should know In his poem, Imam Ash-Shaltibi, he said that, you know, you should know that the Qur'an, that the rope of Allah is the Qur'an. And you should cling to this rope uh, with all your might. And you should, you should make jihad to have a relationship with it. That's why the Quran, the verse, وَجَاهِدْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا Where Allah says, you should make jihad with it. Uh, Ibn Qayyim said, it is uh, the Quran. Like you have to struggle to have a relationship with the Quran. It's a form of struggle. It takes effort. There is a beautiful narration of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which says, Al-Quran, حَبْلُ اللَّهِ مَمْدُورُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ which says that the Qur'an is the rope of Allah which extends from the heavens. And one side is being maintained by Allah and the other side is being maintained by you. So it's important for each and every one of us to have an intimate relationship with the Qur'an. And unfortunately that gets lost uh, in, in some, for, for a number of reasons, which is extremely concerning, you know. And one of the biggest challenges was mentioned by Muhammad Asad, who said that, when the Qur'an is reduced to a cultural relic or simply an, a lens for romanticized historic reflection, the ummah is going to be lost. The third problem is that people recite the Qur'an only for barakah, for barakah. You know, I read it, it's barakah, barakah. But we forgot that the barakah of the Qur'an comes from following the Qur'an and what's called istimbat. Uh, to extract ideas and strategies and thoughts. The Qur'an is bahar, is an ocean. So instead of just reducing it to a simple moment of selfish religious blessing, the greater role that we have and greater responsibility we have is to find the intersectionality between the Qur'an and our lives. And if we don't, we're going to suffer. I remember after 7-7, seven, seven, there was a brother, subhanAllah, who his, after the bombing in London, in 2007, his neighbor, they lived in a Muslim neighborhood where the bombing happened. And his neighbor asked him for a copy of the Quran in English. So he gave it to him. And that neighbor, he finished the Quran in two weeks. Then afterwards, they had a party for his neighbor. And as they were having the party, his non-Muslim neighbor, who finished the Quran in English in two weeks, he said to my friend, where's the second book? He said, no, there's no second book. He said, no, there has to be a second book. He said, why? He said, because the people in this neighborhood, they don't follow this book. They live according to a, a, another book, subhanAllah. So what this approach that we're going to engage in now does is does not allow us to reduce the Qur'an to a cultural rhetoric, rhetoric, a lens for simple romanticized originalism, if you will, uh, going back to the original times and making that romanticized. And the third is reducing the Qur'an to barakah. And what I mean by barakah is a... a imaginary barakah whereas the quran the primary goal of the quran is to extract lessons and meanings and implications of the quran in our lives so the first foundation that we're going to talk about is the revelation of the quran and imam ibn juzay he says allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the revelation to the prophet in mecca when he was 40 years old and it continued through the hijra his migration and up until he passed away in Medina, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The total period of revelation was 20 years. Of course, we know the strong opinion is 23 years. It is reported that was also 23 years. The difference is based on religious scholars' disagreement on the date of the Prophet's death, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Was he 63 years old or 60 years old? The majority of muarrikhin. Uh, historians state that he was 63, sallallahu alayhi wa 
How was the Quran revealed to him? This is very interesting. At times Allah would reveal an entire Allah revealed an entire chapter to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like Surah Fatiha. And at other times he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, revealed different verses to him, like what taqu yaman turja'una fihi ila Allah. You know, fear the day when everything returns to Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu would organize those verses according to and chapters according to the direction of Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. The history of revelation, the first part of the Quran revealed to him was the opening, of course, of Surah Al-Alaq. Iqra' bismi rabbik, recite in the name of your Lord. And then Surah Al-Muddathir. Ya ayyuhal Muddathir, qum fa'anthir. Oh, you who are covered, when he went to his wife and said, cover me, cover me. Ya ayyuhal Muddathir, stand and warn. And then Surah Al-Muzammil. And it's interesting if you look at the first three chapters of the Quran, you find three important themes. Number one is, Surah Al-Alaq is the need to learn. Number two, Surah Al-Muddathir is the need to speak truth to power. Qum fa'anzir. And Surah Al-Muzammil is the need to stand and worship. Qum ilayla ila qalila. And these really, these first three chapters, give you the foundation of a Muslim personality. Is knowledge, activism, and worship. And worship here meaning in the, all of it is worship meaning in the specific ten, sense like praying and being someone who has this taqarrub with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Surat Al-Alaq is telling us, iqra' bismi rabbik, rabbik, right? Recite and not only learn, this is very beautiful, as we talk about Surat Al-Alaq maybe in the future, iqra' don't just learn, but learn with morals and ethics. Iqra' billah, read with the name of your Lord. So your knowledge has a moral compass. Number two, قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ صوت المدثر is to stand and speak truth to power. The office of prophethood is found at the feet of those who stand for truth. And the third, قُمِ لَيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا the office of prophethood is about worship. So now we see sometimes the divide in the Muslim community between the activists and quote-unquote the religious scholars or the, the worshippers, where subhanAllah, uh, the first three chapters of the Quran marry all these knowledge, information for transformation, da'wah and speaking truth to power, and worship. Ibadah, mashallah. So first was Surat Al-Alaq, then Surat Al-Mudathir, and then Surat Al-Muzammil. And here you can see I, I numbered them for you, so you can find them here. And Surah Al-Muzammil is considered the first entire chapter sent to the Prophet. Some, some said, uh, sorry, Surah Al-Muzammil was the first chapter revealed entirely to the Prophet. Some, while other religious scholars said it was Al-Fatiha. He said the first opinion is correct because of this authentic narration. This is the narration of Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, who here in this long narration, you know, says, Hatta ja'ahu al-haq, you know, until the truth came to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, while he was in the cave of Hira. And what was he doing in the cave of Hira? Uh, the narration of Bukhari, kan yatahannaf. He was recognizing Allah's oneness and, 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 and magnifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angel came to him and said, iqra, and the prophet said, ma ana biqari, I can't read. Then he said it to him three times, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he grabbed me and he squeezed me, he says, until I felt I couldn't bear it anymore. And then finally, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. And then of course he went uh, after this to his wife. He was shaken and he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, uh, Dathiruni, Dathiruni, cover me, cover me. And then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala revealed Surah Al-Mudathir to him, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The last part of the Quran revealed to him as a complete chapter was Surah Al-Nasr. إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ صلى الله عليه وسلم Some scholars contend that it was verses in the second chapter of the Qur'an that pro prohibit interest in, in Surat Al-Baqarah while others said it was the verses right before that the one that I mentioned earlier وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمَ تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ And also the footnotes you're going to find some, some notes about like Aisha when she was born, when she died. Most of the footnotes in there you're going to find are written this way. So hopefully they'll be helpful for you inshallah. 
the compilation of the Quran during the Prophet's lifetime, the Quran was dispersed into different pages and in the memories of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, until the Prophet's death. The first person to compile the Quran was Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhum. And Sayyidina Ali, he actually compiled the Quran in chronological order. Subhanallah. And that, that, that copy of the Quran existed for a number of centuries and it had his notes and it was lost. And as far as I know, I think it was lost when the Tartar came into Iraq and ransacked Baghdad. But subhanAllah, it was lost. And look what Imam Ibn Juzay says, if that copy was discovered, the knowledge in it is immense. Allahu Akbar. So the first person to actually compile the whole Quran uh, was Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu in chronological order. And I remember when I lived in Egypt, there was actually a PhD done and then it was published of a person who did tafsir. Uh, he did part of it, I think, as a PhD, but then it was initially completely published. He did tafsir of the Quran in chronological order. It's really cool, mashallah. When the army of Musaylama al-Kadhab killed a large number of Sahaba, and here at the bottom you'll see who was Musaylama ibn al-Habib. Uh, when the army of Musaylama killed a group of the companions who were masters in the Quran and recitation, and here we see something, that even though they were scholars and they were activists, it didn't keep, uh, scholars and saintly people, it didn't keep them from going and fighting. It didn't go and keep them from being people on the front lines to defend the Muslims. You know, knowledge should never be used as an excuse not to stand for what's right and not to be the first to, to, to be at the defense of the Muslim community. Allah says, How many of the Prophet's righteous people fought with him? So a large number of Hufal and scholars of the Quran. You know, nowadays, you know, the way sometimes that people of knowledge are lauded and treated is, is unacceptable in our tradition. We don't disrespect scholars, but also we should not uh, over embellish anybody's praise. I had a teacher once from Ab Yemen and people used to praise him all the time. And he said, you know, and he quoted the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that said, if you say Jazakallahu Khairan to someone, this is the best thing you can say. Like there's, he said, there's no need to like extol my virtues in this way. It's not good for me spiritually. So subhanAllah, in the early days of Islam, who was it that was dying, defending the Muslim community? Were the ulama and the huffal. So Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he came to Sayyidina Abu Bakr and he, he mentioned to him, you know, that we should compile the Quran in order to protect it from change. And here, for those of you who take usul al-fiqh with me, we're going to talk about this in the future, we see that Umar ibn Khattab is suggesting something for which there is no clear text. There's no text of the Prophet that says you have to compile the Quran. There's nothing in the Quran itself that says you should compile the Quran. Nor are there specific directions on how to chronologically or otherwise compile the Quran. But Sayyidina Umar is not acting on a specific text, but he's acting on the general benefit for the community, al-maqasid. And this is one of the first fatwa after the passing of the Prophet Wasallam, which we say fatwa maqasidi, is a fatwa given on the, the, the philosophical goals of sharia. And what are those, those legal philosophical goals? One of them is to protect the religion. And that's why Abu Bakr initially, when Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab comes to him, he doesn't agree with him. And that's the second lesson we take from this moment, that conflict can also be beneficial. That's why subhanAllah at NYU, we have a course, it's not called conflict resolution, it's called conflict transformation. How do you, how do you guide conflict in a way that it can be transformative? So Umar ibn Khattab is coming to Abu Bakr and he doesn't have a specific verse of the Qur'an or hadith, but he's acting on what's called at maqasir al-shari'ah, masalih al-mursala, masalih al amma what is going to be a benefit for everybody, what is going to bring benefit and protect the faith and serve the community, subhanAllah. 
So Abu Bakr, he commanded it to be collected, yet its chapters are not in the order they are in today. It's very important that you understand this. The order of the Quran that you have today happened during the time of Uthman ibn Affan. Right? The order of the Quran, Fatiha, Baqara, Ari Imran, Nisa, Ma'ida. The strong opinion is that, as we'll talk about, this happened in the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Some people said it happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu but it's not a strong, it's not a strong opinion and it's not supported by the historical record. But the point here is that Abu Bakr and Umar, Umar comes to him acting on the maqasid, sharia, like now when people said we should close the masjids for salah, we should close the masjids for Jum'ah, those great ulama, you know, we should avoid congregational acts of worship, even janazah. There's no specific text for this. These are fatwas based on maqas and sharia, the objectives of sharia. And there's training for this. Our last year in Azhar, we, we le- were taught how to employ uh, maqas and sharia in fatwa, the objectives of sharia. And many times we have a large number of converts with us tonight, a large number of the fatwa, religious answers that uh, converts need are going to be really generated by the overall benefit of the objectives of Sharia. So Omar reacts, they differ, but they differ with etiquette. And then, فَمَادَ قَلْبُ أَبُوْ بَكْرِ He said, Sa'ad ibn Abu Qas said that Abu Bakr's heart, it, it, it gave in to the suggestion of Sayyidina Umar, as did the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, to compile the Qur'an in order to protect it from change. So Abu Bakr commanded it to be collected. And this is a third lesson we take, that the aqidah of the Muslims was not one of fatalism. Well, you know, whatever Allah decrees, Allah said he's going to protect the Qur'an, so why we even have to protect the Qur'an, right? They could have said, Allah says, indeed, we'll protect the Qur'an. Why do we need to protect it? So we learned something, that the promises in the Qur'an for things to happen should not be used as excuses not to work for those things to happen. That's not how it works. So even though Allah says, we promise to protect the Qur'an بِمَا اسْتُحْفِظُ مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا عَلَيْهِ الشُّهَدَ Still, the early Muslims understood that the promises of Allah existed, and this is an opportunity to reap the rewards and blessings of that promise. That's why we say, if you see the opportunity to fulfill the promise of Allah, cash in. The opposite, they didn't use it as an excuse they saw it as, a, as, a, as an opportunity and motivation. So Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he ordered the, the Qur'an to be compiled, yet its chapters were not in the order they are today. That copy that Abu Bakr compiled went to Umar, and after Abu Bakr passed on, and then finally to Umar's daughter, the wife of the Prophet Hafsa. And something in Qur'anic studies especially in Qira'at, and we don't have, maybe we'll talk about this in our, our Tajweed section on Swiss, is the role that women played in the preservation of the Qur'an, and the Qira'at is incredible. And even in Hadith, you know, Imam al Dhahabi said, there has never been in history a woman liar of Hadith. Never, subhanAllah. And during that time, pages of the Qur'an written by the Sahaba spread across the Muslim world. So the Sahaba would consult the nuskha, the copy of Hafsa, write it down, and then check it, and then go. And I actually saw this with my own eyes, the teacher who I memorized the Qur'an with from Senegal, he told me that years ago in Senegal, you know, books in those 60 years ago were still rare. So there would be one copy of the Qur'an in the mahdara, in the school that everybody would write from, following like this old system, subhanAllah. So during that time, pages of the Qur'an written by the companions spread across the Muslim world with slight differences. Concerned, Hudhayfa ibn Yaman, the secret keeper of the Prophet, encouraged Sayyiduna... Uh, uh, um, just one second, let me do this. Sayyiduna Uthman ibn Affan, he encouraged him to compile the Qur'an again in order to unite people on the Qur'an. And here's another lesson that we take. And what he means by slight differences is in the notes, the footnotes of the Sahaba that they would write in the Qur'an, people began to confuse them with the Qur'an and their tafsir. So Sayyidina Hudayfa, he 
encouraged Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu to compile the Qur'an a second time. Why? For the unity of the Muslims. To preserve the Qur'an and also to preserve the unity. And here we can learn something, especially for scholars of fiqh and teachers of fiqh. You know, if, you, if you're just going to stick with your madhab and you know it's going to create disunity, then you should give the opinion that brings unity, as long as it's correct. Look at the Hanbali madhab, who they say you have to see the moon, right, for Ramadan. But subhanAllah, listen to this beautiful opinion in their madhab. If you know that you saw the moon, and you went back to the majority of the Muslims, and you told them, I saw the moon, and the Muslim majority said, no, you didn't see the moon, they said the, the best thing for you to do is stick with the, was stick with the jama'ah. For why? Wihdatil ummah. To keep the Muslim community together. Now, subhanAllah, people find religious utility in saying, because I've created differences, this is the sign I'm on the truth. Ya Allah. Look at Hudhayfa ibn Yaman. It says we says, even though the Quran now is protected, he said we should compile it again and send copies of the Qur'an all over the Muslim world to keep Muslims together. The unity of the community, subhanAllah. And that's why, uh, if you're Maliki, you know in the Maliki Madhab, it's makru, we don't say Bismillah rahman rahim in Salah. But look at Imam al-Maziri, who was from southern Italy. We ask Allah to bless the people of Italy and protect them. Imam al-Maziri from Mazara, which is still in southern, southern Italy, who... Uh, subhanallah, he, 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 when he came to uh, 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 a part of the Muslim world where, subhanallah, people, they were, they were reading uh, the uh, uh, Fatiha with Basmala. So he, subhanallah, he, he, his student came to visit him, Imam al-Mazri, who was great, a great Maliki jurist. And when al-Mazri led Salah, in that city, which was primarily Shafi, the Shafis, they say, you have to read Basmala in Salah. He said, Al-Mazri, he said, Bismillah rahman rahim alhamdu. He said, after I went to him, I said, Shaykh, in our madhab, it's makru to read Bismillah. He said, yeah, but it's an obligation to keep the Muslims together. And these people, if you don't read the Basmala in Salah, they're gonna, it's going to create disunity. Look at Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, who a group of people, they sent him a letter that they were arguing in their mosque about what does it mean Allah rose in the sky and, and they said, we started to fight. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he wrote back to them a small essay. The essay, subhanAllah, he doesn't say anything about the attributes of Allah. His entire essay is, why are you fighting? So now where is, where is the concern for the unity of the community in fatwa? in teaching, in guiding people. Instead of splitting, the sign, as one of my teachers used to say, the sign of the Rabbani and the Faqih is that wherever they go, they will create unity, even if there's differences, mashallah. Even if there's differences, you're gonna find unity, uh, subhanAllah, amongst the people. If I can ask the people, please, uh, we're all adults here, uh, I believe if we can stop uh, marking on the screen. I did try to disable it, but for some reason it keeps going. And mashallah, if there's someone here that wants to like have fun, you can go do a lot of stuff. You don't have to come to a religious lecture. <laughs> you know what I mean? To have fun. So what do we learn in the very early iterations of Islam? Is that Sayyidina Amr al-Khattab works on the idea of masalih al amma the general benefits, maqasid sharia, also, we see Abu Bakr's caution about doing something different. Number three, we see that the scholars of Islam didn't use their knowledge as an excuse not to serve. They were on the front line serving people till they died, subhanAllah. The third is the role of women in the preservation of revelation. And this is something even Bukhari, for example, the most authentic nuskha of Bukhari was preserved by two women, subhanAllah, Zainab and uh, Fatima of Hirat, Afghanistan. It's okay, Elizabeth. Oh, okay, that's fine. If you want to annotate, you can. If you can annotate in a good way, then fine. I thought some, in my 13 to 15 year old, by the end of my class, it literally looks like a subway car. MashaAllah, reminds me of New York. 
And the fourth, again, is the need to give an, a religious opinion that is going to not only preserve the religion, but bring the Muslims together. That's why Imam al-Ghazali, he said, if you see somebody teaching that creates disunity and attacks the Muslims and the scholars, you should run from them. You should avoid them. So Hudhaytha ibn Yaman, he can, and if anyone wants to take notes on the side here, you can I, can, I can undo this so that people can see, but it's going to, uh, when I scroll up, I'll have to erase them. So feel free to underline or write anything you think is important I'm saying on this document, it's fine. If you want to, you just click annotate, inshallah. So Elizabeth, go for it, inshallah. Sorry about that. During that time, pages, so here, Hudhaytha ibn Yaman encourages the khalif, the khalif, and look also, each time this happens, it's someone of a lesser degree of authority advising someone in a greater degree of authority. Here's another lesson that, you know, can you imagine trying to advise Abu Bakr or advise if you're Hudhaifa talking to Uthman? Like you're going to be, you're going to be shy. But look at the Sahaba, how it's not, this meritocracy is not to the point where there's not an open flow of ideas and engagement. So look, the Qur'an is compiled because people who are in lesser authority advise someone in greater authority. Now, mashallah, how many of our institutions and nonprofits could learn a lesson from this? Just as the early adab of the Sahaba, one of my teachers used to say that when you read the early history of the companions, you're learning about very, very nice character and adab and commitment, subhanAllah. So Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu he agreed with Hudhaifa ibn Yaman and he ordered Zayd ibn Thabit to lead the project because Zayd was one of the most proficient and fluent reciters of the Quran who actually read the Quran to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with three companions from the Quraysh Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdurrahman ibn Harith, and Sa'd ibn As. And Uthman said, fi shay'in bi Quraysh. If you differ in anything, then use the Qurayshi dialect because this was the dialect of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's considered the most fasih, uh, eloquent dialect of the Arabs. This committee began to work and here's the, the, another lesson we can take. Working in a group. You know, he could have just told Zayd ibn Thabit to do it by himself. He's a hafith. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Yadullahi ma'al jama'ah, right? The help of Allah is with the group. How many lessons were taken, mashallah, just from the very beginning? acting on maqasid sharia scholarship should lead to sacrifice that those the flow of ideas regardless of a person's importance or position doing things for the unity of the muslims doing things to preserve the religion and then here working in a group one of my teachers used to tell me the sign that your religious knowledge is truly beneficial is that you are able to work with others everybody can be a savior by themselves Heroism is, is easily accomplished in the room alone. But the ability to work and engage and be patient and nuanced, this is, this is the sign that someone has what we call religious EQ. Right? There's a religious IQ, but there's also a religious EQ, the emotional intelligence that religion demands. The committee began the work using the copy of the Quran held by Hafsa as the final reference for this compilation. And Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, who, Uthman, he memorized the Qur'an when he was 36 years old, by the way. He also engaged offering critical feedback and uh, engaging in the process. And you know, there's something else we can learn here, Dina, that the generational wars that exist now, ageism, Sayyidina Uthman at this time, he's very old. Zayd ibn Thabit, he's still young. But there's, there's no threat, like we need to get rid of the uncles, these young people don't. No, they realize that they need each other. Once the group finished, the, the caliph ordered official copies of it made and sent to the major centers of the Muslim world. And in addition, he commanded that all other copies of the Quran be burnt. The order of the surahs we know today was organized by Uthman and Zayd ibn Thabit. It is reported that it was also the prophet who established his order. But as I said, and, and this is Ibn Jay's words, Ibn Juzay, that opinion is weak. The spelling and organization of the Qur'an, the first person to address the spelling of the Qur'an, placing the dots on letters was Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. At the command of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, talk about two very controversial, interesting people. 
In addition to that, Al Hajjaj organized each part of the Quran into fourths. So his Robo, uh, Robo, and then his bin Adza. It is also reported that the dots were invented by Yahya ibn Ya'mar, and that actually is the stronger opinion, by the way. It is also attributed to Abu Aswad al Du'ali, who was the student of Sayyidina Ali. Al Hajjaj is also credited for dividing the Quran into Adza, 30 parts of the Quran, with some of it attributed to Al Ma'mun. Al-Abbasi. The names of the Quran. The Quran has four names as mentioned in the Quran itself. Al-Quran, Al-Furqan, Al-Kitab, and Al-Dhikr. So of course, Al-Quran, we talked about what that means. Al-Furqan, which clarifies things. Al-Kitab, the book, right? The true book. And Al-Dhikr, the truthful remembrance of Allah. The rest of the words like Al-Azim, Al-Kareem, Al-Mateen, Al-Aziz, Al-Majid, Kullu has sifat. All those are like adjectives, but they're not names of the Qur'an. And here the Shaykh, he gives his explanation of the meanings of those words. And below you'll see a short biography of all the people mentioned up here. The word Qur'an is the root of the word Qara'a. He recited, but carries the meaning of the passive participle maqru, something recited not apples. The same applies to Al-Furqan, a mufarraq. There's a principle, I don't want to make it hard in Arabic, that sometimes a, a word can be used as a masdar, a foundational word, but it actually means the passive participle. So Quran means what was recited. Al-Furqan, what clarified between truth and falsehood. It is a root that means to separate Tafriqa, because the Quran distinguishes between truth and falsehood. And it can separate so many other things, sadness, happiness, you, you can name it. Al-Kitab is a root word that means was written, Al-Maktub, because the Quran is written. The Quran is named a dhikr because it mentions the names of Allah, the hereafter, and it contains admonishments and exhortations. The word ayah, maybe you heard this word before, verse, is from the word alama, indicator. And while it applies to the verses of the Qur'an in particular, it is applied to the entire Qur'an since Al-Qur'an kulluhu ayah ala wujud, ala wujudi sidqi Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the Qur'an is a proof in the prophethood of Sayyidina Muhammad, in the Prophet and his integrity, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So alhamdulillah, that's the first foundation. You can see like this is good information to know. Uh, later on, he's going to get a little deeper into other subjects. Some of these things may, he may have learned before. But I really found his introduction to uh, the Qur'an extremely important uh, and extremely in, uh, beneficial. Al-Khitma, how are you, what do you mean by that word, Samia? It's a good question, but what do you mean by that? So ideally, Hisham, people start to memorize the Qur'an around 8 or 9. Uh, khitma means to complete a reading of the Qur'an. So when you finish the entire Qur'an, it's called Khitma or Khatim. Or Khatma. Khatma to Qur'an. So if you read it from Fatiha Hat nas in the Desi culture, for example, uh, they call khat, uh, khatma, uh, Khatim or Qur'an or Khitma to Qur'an. No problem. Sheikh uh, Hisham, so it depends on the moral and uh, 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 cognitive ability of the student. So, so yeah, no, people memorize the Quran during the time of the prophets, like Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abu Talib, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Sayyidina Aisha, Sayyidina Umm Salama. There's actually a list of those Sahaba who are known to be Hufaz, mashallah. MashaAllah. Uh, Elizabeth, Mus'haf means the Quran. Mus'haf with a hat. Mus'haf. I'll write it for you here. Mus'haf. Let's take now the second foundation and then we'll stop, inshallah. But again, for those of you who came a little bit later, sorry about the links issues. We still have some challenges. We only have a few people. Um, the Sahaba memorized the Quran in different order. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. The order of the Quran now came at the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. Meaning Fatiha, Baqra, Ali Imran, Nisa, Ma'ida. Yeah, we'll talk about it at the end, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, I, I sent a link up above Elizabeth. I think if you use this link, you'll be able to see the footnotes. So Dina, your question about women reciting the Quran, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he mentions with the sound isna that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was walking and he heard a woman reading Surah Al-Ghashiyah, uh, Al-Atak Hadith Al-Ghashiyah. She was a little bit older. Uh, it doesn't specify how old she was. And she said, Al-Atak Hadith Al-Ghashiyah. And the Prophet said, Atakni Al-Ghashiyah. He responded, he said, yes, the Ghashiyah came to me. Like, has the news of Al-Ghashiyah reached you? The hereafter, he said, yes. And he didn't tell her, stop reciting the Quran. So this is an evidence that a woman can recite the Quran. Because if it was wrong for her to recite the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ, we have a very important principle in usul al-fiqh, that a teaching, it's impossible for us to believe, I don't know if someone can type it, it's impossible for us to believe that the Prophet would not teach something at the moment it's needed to be taught. So if it was forbidden for, like if someone did something haram in front of the Prophet, he would stop them. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So if she was doing something haram, he would have stopped her. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And also Umar Darda, she used to teach the Quran in Masjid al-Amawi. The wife of Abu Darda, radiallahu anhuma. And nobody stopped her. Radiallahu anha. So uh, the strong evidence found in uh, in 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 this narration is that it's allowed right you mentioned the adab of the sahaba how the best book is really the 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 books the men and women around the sahaba there's two books men around the messenger women around the messenger mashallah there are nice books man alhamdulillah any more questions before we start the second one Nice. So the second discussion is going to be on the Meccan and Medina chapters. Yeah, Omar, khalas, yani, let's leave Hajjaj to be with Allah. But, you know, of course, his killing of the Sahaba, his attack of Mecca, and same with Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the genocide of the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, you know, it, it's best to leave the dead to be with Allah. We can be critical of their actions, right? Just like we can say what they did with the Quran is praiseworthy, mashallah. Uh, so I think it's good with these people, me personally, to be critical of their acts or praiseworthy of their good acts and leave the masiruhum ilallah. Leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Leave it to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because also like, it's not, it's not gonna la yufidul amal, right? Arguing about these kind of things isn't going to lead anyone to action, you know. Say like that knowledge doesn't benefit and the ignorance doesn't hurt anybody. So what we can be think about is like we can be critical of their actions and what they did that's good. Like you said, what they did with the Quran is incredible. Um, you know, mashallah. The second foundation is the Meccan and Medina chapters uh, that we're going to discuss now. No problem. And the chapters of the Qur'an are divided into two, those that were revealed in Mecca and those that were revealed in Medina. A Meccan chapter is a chapter revealed during the Prophet's time in Mecca, sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, even if he was outside of Mecca when it was revealed, right? So a Meccan chapter is a chapter of Qur'an or part or verse of the Qur'an revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his time in Mecca. So, for example, hypothetically, if something had been revealed to the Prophet in Ta'if, would we call that Ta'ifiyah or Mecca as a chapter? I'm just asking you guys. Would we say that's a Ta'if chapter or a Mecca chapter? Exactly. Hey, Ahmed, good to see you, man. Because the that was the Prophet's time in Mecca. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here's a question. Anything revealed to the Prophet before his migration 
to Medina is considered Mecca, even if it was revealed outside of Mecca. Outside of Mecca. A Medini chapter are those chapters revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his time in Medina, even if he was outside of a Medina. So for example, in his time in Medina, when he went to Mecca and verses of the Quran were sent to him in Mecca during his era in Medina, would those verses be considered Mecca or Medina? Would they be Meccan verses or Medina verses? You understand the question? So exactly. So the Prophet ﷺ is in Medina, but he goes to Mecca. Well, because it's in that Medina phase of his life, even if those verses were sent to him in Mecca, they're still called Medinia. Mashallah. Good job, Lacey, holding it down. Alhamdulillah. Excellent. Kareem, mashallah. The division of chapters. In relation to Mecca and Medina chapters, Quran scholars divided his chapters into three types. The first are those religious, what religious scholars agreed Allah revealed in Medina, and there are 22 in total. So you want to remember this strong opinion is that out of 114 chapters, 22% into Medina. What are those chapters? Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa, Maida, and Fal. So the first uh, after Fatiha, the next five chapters Baqra, Ali Imran, Nisa, Maida, and Fa. Then Surah Tawbah, which is the ninth chapter, Surah Nur, which is the 24th chapter, Surah Ahzab is the 33rd chapter, Surah Muhammad is the 47th chapter, Surah Fat is the 48th, Hujarat is the 49th, then Surah Al Hadid, Surah Al Mujadila, Surah Al Hashar, Surah Al Muntahina, Al Saf, Al Jumu'ah. So these 22 chapters, scholars agree, were sent for the most part, meaning most of the chapter, in Medina. The second are those that scholars differed over. Were they revealed in Mecca or Medina? And there are 13. No, no, they're not in order. Uh, no, this is an order, actually. No, no, it's not, because, yeah, yeah, this is an order. In a sense, they're chronologically in order, but they're not like right next to each other in the Quran, right? So, Atoba is nine, Nord is 24, Azab is 33, but it's in a chronological order. Yeah, good question. The second type are those that scholars differed over. Did Allah reveal them in Mecca or Medina? And they are 13. So, Al Fatiha, the strong opinion I heard from Dr. Abdul Haifa Ramawi, who was one of our teachers in Al Azhar, Rahimahullah, he passed away is that Al-Fatiha actually was revealed twice. We'll talk about this in our explanation of Surah Al-Fatiha, that the first chapter of the Quran actually was sent in Mecca and Medina. Then Al-Ra'd, the thunder, then Al-Nahal, the bee, then Surah Al-Hajj, Al-Insan. Salah was not five times prayer until Isra Mi'raj but they used to pray twice a day. Uh, so that's, and also in Surah Al-Hijr, which is a Meccan chapter, Ahmed, Allah says, وَلَقَدَ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعَ مَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ مَجِيدٍ Allah mentions that Fatiha was revealed to the Prophet in Surah Al-Hijr. So as I said, there is this strong opinion, as I'll explain when we get to Surah Al-Fatiha, that Al-Fatiha was revealed twice, once in Mecca, and once in Medina. And there's a reason for that we'll discuss that I heard from, from my professor. It's really cool, mashallah. Exactly, I'm trying to bait you into it. So, Al-Fatiha, Al-Ra'd, Al-Nahal, Al-Hajj, Al-Insan, Al-Mutaffifin, Al-Qadr, Al-Bayna, Al-Zilzal, Al-Ma'un, Ikhlas, Faraq, Al-Nas. These chapters are chapters that scholars differ over. Some of them, they say, were revealed in Mecca and Medina for reasons that we'll uncover in the future, like Fatiha. And others, they just differ. Like, where, where were they sent? The last type are those chapters that scholars agree Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent in Mecca, and they are the chapters not mentioned above. So the Shaykh, mashallah, he pulled a fast one on us. He's like, look, man, 
anything I mentioned about I didn't mention above is <laughs> was revealed in Mecca. Subhanallah. MashaAllah, way to go. An important note, sometimes a verse Allah revealed in Medina is found in a Meccan chapter. And a verse Allah revealed in Mecca sometimes is found in a Medina one. Its occurrence is rare and sometimes it's disputed. Like it's not, it is actually Meccan or it is actually Medina. They used Al-Fatiha because, you know, the strong opinion is Al-Fatiha is the fourth chapter sent to the Prophet And there's also the opinion uh, that the uh, um, Al-Fatiha is the first complete chapter sent to the Prophet that I don't know, Busra. I don't know, Bushra. I don't know. But it's it's safe to say that you did not have an objection. So we don't have in the historical record uh, an objection, uh, even from Sayyidina Ali himself, uh, to the Quran being ordered in that way. And then you have ijma, the consensus of the Sahaba and the early Muslim scholars that it, this isn't this wasn't an issue of concern for them. The issue of concern for them was preserving the Qur'an as it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, meaning the chapter, its verses, and its words. And inshallah, one day we can get into the study of the words and spelling of the Qur'an. Wallahi, it's unbelievable the care they took. There is even rules for when you should be quiet when you read. What's called ahkam sukut. Like, alhamdulillah, alladhi anzara ala abrihi al-kitab wa lam yaja'allahu iwaja qayyima. Is it iwaja? Qayyima or Iwaja Qayyima. You have narrations back to the Sahaba. That's why uh, Shatabi says, Wasaktum Mukhtaru Bila Tanafusin. So wallahi it, it's an incredible subject. And the, the 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 second course in Tajweed that will be up on Swiss, I begin to open that discussion for you. In that book, A Treasure Found. It's incredible. And what I've noticed is people, when they first hear about this, like, oh my God, what does this mean? But the more they study it, they achieve yaqeen. So they go from, oh my God, what does it mean? To studying it and then having yaqeen. See the rhyme, yo. So an important note, sometimes a verse Allah revealed in Medina is in a Meccan chapter. And sometimes you may find a verse in a Mecca chapter. And it was revealed in Mecca in a Medina one. Its occurrence is very rare and often it's, it's disputed. The subject matter of Meccan and Medina chapters. Meccan chapters tend to focus on proving Islamic belief, responding to the arguments of the disbelievers, and the stories of the Prophet's personal commitment to faith and improving character. Medina chapters are distinguished by their focus on Sharia rulings, responding to the arguments of the Jews and Christians, the qualities of the hypocrites, teaching the art of fatwa in response to questions, and the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. But there's going to be some overlap. Ibn Juzay says, usually when you see Ya ayyuha ladhina amanu, the chapter is Medini, Madaniya. And when you see Ya ayyuha nas, it's a Meccan chapter, inshallah. So, yeah, exactly. The verses as they are, as, as they were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, without any doubt. Although, you know, there may be different uh, numberings. So for example, we'll talk about this in the future, like Surat Al-Fatiha, some people consider Bismillah an ayah, some don't. Uh, but we can talk about that's coming up actually in, in Surat Al-Fatiha. Inshallah, next week we're going to pick up here the third foundation, the purposes and the teachings of the Quran. And then we'll talk about the fields of study associated with the Quran. What were all of the sciences that Muslims initially extracted from the Quran? No, you're not asking too much. Never say that, man. Don't be self-deprecating. Mashallah. That's what you ask any questions you like you guys want. Like, if I don't know the answer, I don't know the answer, subhanAllah. And if you don't agree with me, it's okay. Like, don't worry, mashallah. So the, the, the next thing we'll also talk about is the uloom which were extract extracted from the Quran and began to form the foundations of early Muslim universities. Um, and he mentions them here, right? Tafsir, the science of recitation, legal rulings, abrogation, the science of hadith, stories, tasawwuf, creed, Islamic legal philosophy, language, grammar, and rhetoric, and also history. I would add to this history. Uh, Muslims added history and even science, if you look at someone like Ar-Razi, uh, Rahimahullah. And so we'll go through those different ulum, 
and we'll stop. And then the week after that, we'll begin to talk about the different scholars of tafsir and their approaches uh, and so on and so forth. So like I believe in two to four weeks, we should finish uh, these foundations. And then inshallah ta'ala, we can pick it up with al-fatiha, hopefully by the time Ramadan rolls around. If you have any questions, inshallah. No, no, man, my daughter actually, my daughter today, yesterday grabbed my glasses and, uh, you know, unfortunately came off. So chapters were revealed, as we mentioned earlier, either completely or the Prophet some would order chapters. And the Sahaba, they didn't, they did not mess with the ordering of the ayat or the chapters. What Sayyidina Uthman and, the, and Sayyidina Zayd ibn Thabit did was just compile the Qur'an as you have it now. Fatiha to Nas. That's it. But they didn't, of course, change anything in that way. And again, we, we would have seen a complete, there would have been a massive splintering amongst the Sahaba if something like that happened. So let's be clear here, right? The, the chapters of the Qur'an so some of them you had the writer, the scribes of the Prophet Sallallahu like Zayd ibn Thabit, he was one of the scribes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, most definitely. Like Muawiyah was one of the scribes, scribes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Absolutely, and we're gonna talk about that soon. The different Qiraat and the Sabbat Aharuf, we'll also discuss, discuss that as well. Most definitely like, for example, Warsha Nafi, is known that that was a narration that Sayyidina Umar he read with. The narration of Sayyidina Shu'bah from Imam Asim was how Abdullah ibn Mas'ud recited the Qur'an. So it's very important in the, in the preservation of the Qur'an, unlike fiqh, there is no ijtihad when it comes to what is preserved in the sense of authentically taken care of and preserved. Nobody touched, nobody manipulates that or touches that, of course. Very important. Very important. Very important to understand that. Yeah, these glasses are definitely a new fashion statement, mashallah. No problem. And feel free to ask any questions. So we just wanted to do a quick check-in with all of our Swiss family. Let you know we love you guys. We appreciate you. And... Uh, yeah, this Dina, completely, complete nonsense, man. You know, complete nonsense. It's not supported by the historic record at all. There's no support for that from the historic record. Um, we wanted to do like a quick check-in uh, and just make sure that everybody's okay, safe and sound, inshallah, and, and needing anything. Uh, we want to let you know we support you tonight. I don't know if you saw, we introduced Sheikh Imran who is now our Director of Development at Swiss, as well as one of our instructors here. And we just wanna say because of your support, your $10 a month, mashallah, we're able to really teach now, I think every week around 2000 kids, um, ages from the ages of 13 to 18, alhamdulillah. And that's really because of your support. And we're going to be rolling out some new things soon. And we also plan to do some iftars with you guys, virtual iftar, B-Y-O-I. Bring your own iftar, uh, inshallah. And we will see you all next week. I will post this video tonight uh, on the Swiss page, inshallah. So if you want to watch it again and take notes or whatever. Zakallah khairan. Keep us in your du'as. Sama sama yuzaydi and let other people know one thing you can do for us if you want to help us is just like on social media write a review of swiss encourage your friends to jump jump on and support the work don't steal that from me i mean that's my not patent that bring your own iftar and so we'll try to do like a virtual iftar we're all together we'll have someone make adhan you know, we'll all go pray on our own, come back and eat and just, you know, be in a situation that we can talk and, and be there for one another. Zakam Allahu khairan wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.